time of praise today. Aren't you thankful you serve a good God? Hallelujah. If you're able, let's stand together today. It's a good day to be in the house of the Lord. Why don't you shake hands with somebody next to you and tell them, say, my God is a good God. Praise God. Praise God. Feels good in church today. Thank you for bringing worship into the house of the Lord. And we are entertaining the presence of God in this place today. Ezra chapter 9. Short text today. And I was telling Brother Cannon, just be watching because I ain't got very many notes today. But I do feel very clearly on what I'm going to preach this morning. Brother Andrew knows. I sent this to him on Friday. Both sermons. He hadn't had that happen in a long time. I tell you, he hadn't got both of them at one time like that. But the Lord just on Friday really blessed me and uh, gave me both sermons for today. And then as we would go through these last 48 hours, I'm sitting there shaking my head saying, Lord, you knew all along where we were going to be on this Sunday morning. And I, I've uh, texted my buddy Aaron Dutton and prayed for us today. I said, man, just, just help us today because uh, this has been... I'll tell you what, these 48 hours, I hadn't had these 48 hours in a long time. We did have it back when Brother Horst Krebs passed away and Sister Patterson. And we went through a time there. Man, that was a, it was a rough couple of weeks. And, uh, but I, I, I appreciate the Lord knowing right where we are today. Ezra chapter 9, verse number 8. The Bible says, Now for a little space grace hath been shown from the Lord our God. I'm thankful for the grace of God. To leave us a remnant to escape. And to give us a nail in his holy place. That our God may lighten our eyes. We talked about dark clouds a while ago. That the Lord might lighten our eyes. And give us a little reviving in our bondage. I'm going to preach today. and I want you to look at that part in that sentence. Right at the beginning, and now for a little space, grace. Now, I've preached from this passage many, many times. I'll try to do a little different today with this. But I, I want you to notice that little space. I believe we are living in the little space. Folks, I'm telling you, it doesn't take long to look around and notice God is starting to wrap this thing up and that He is coming very, very soon. And we are living in this little space of grace. Maybe that's what I should have preached under this morning. Little space of grace. But I titled it different today. A word for those gathered here on this Sunday morning at Harvest Church. Don't wait too late. None of us knew 24 hours before Brother Larry Parrish was to pass away that he was going to be leaving. Just a couple of months ago, they really probably wouldn't have even said that about Brother J.C. I'm telling you today, none of us, no matter how young or how old we are, are guaranteed tomorrow. But I'm thankful today we're living in a little space of grace. That when you walk into this house, no matter what sin may plague your past or whatever's trying to rock your present, God says, I've got a glorious future I can give to you. You don't have to wait any longer. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Right now is the acceptable time. Aren't you thankful we serve a good God that places us in a little space of grace? Oh, let's thank the Lord for His presence in this house. Lord Jesus, I love you. I thank you, God, for what you're doing among us. Hallelujah. Well, somebody shout praise the Lord. You can be seated today. The University of Chicago invited Dr. Paul Tillich, a theologian who tried to reconcile Christianity to the rest of the world's religions, to speak on the topic that there are many different paths to God. Boy, it was uh, some more speech. Full of baloney, but it was some more speech. <laughs> and Dr. Tillich spoke for over two hours trying to prove that a literal resurrection of Jesus Christ was ludicrous. Tillich concluded that since there was no such thing as a historical resurrection, it was impossible to have a relationship with a living, risen Jesus Christ. Christianity was regarded as so much emotional, he, he, and I quote his words, mumbo jumbo. <laughs> and after concluding his lengthy speech, he made a mistake. He asked if there were any questions. 
Nobody spoke for a while. It was about as quiet as we just had it just now. Finally, an elderly man pulls out his sack that he had brought with him. Apparently, he knew he was going to speak a while. <laughs> and he grabs an apple. And, he, you know, you knew he was going to speak some wise words because you could tell by the hairs on his head he had been here a little while. And his hair was solid white. And he would stand in the back of the auditorium and he said, Dr. Tillich, I've got one question. And everybody turned toward him. They watched as he pulled out of his sack lunch an apple. And while gazing, he takes a bite out of the apple. I was just hungry. I won't do this today. No, I'm playing. He said, Dr. Tillich, I've got a question. Crunch. <laughs> Munch. He said, my question's a simple one. He just keeps eating the apple. He ain't nervous at all. Not near as nervous as my wife is right now. He said, I ain't ever read them books. And I ain't gonna. Still eating his apple. He said, I can recite the scriptures. He said, I can't recite them in the original Greek and Hebrew like you claim you're doing today. He said, I don't know nothing about Nabor and Hadagor. And took another bite of his apple. He said, all I want to know is this. And they said, he held up his apple. By this point, he's ate a whole lot more than I have, okay? He's ate all of the apple down to the core. And he held up this once sweetly eaten apple, or swiftly eaten apple rather, to his audience. And he said, this apple that I just ate, was it bitter or was it sweet? The esteemed professor was a bit put off by the casual disregard that he had been shown to him, yet he answered in a very exemplary scholarly fashion. He said, I can't possibly answer that question because I didn't taste your apple. What he didn't know was this white-haired guy in the back of the room was a preacher. White-haired guy dropped the core of the apple in his sack and he held up the sack and he said, Neither have you tasted my Jesus. The audience couldn't contain themselves. Over a thousand people did exactly what you just did and started clapping except they stood to their feet and began to cheer and this guy would quickly make his exit. And what this elderly man was saying was this, all you've got to do is have just a little taste of Jesus and you're going to know this thing is not emotionalism but that God is alive and he is well. For the psalmist said in Psalms chapter 34 in verse 8, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusts in the Lord. I'm thankful today on this Sunday morning I don't serve a God that's in a tomb. My God is not preserved like some mummy, but that he is alive in our heart. Brother White, they used to sing it. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. You want to know Jesus? Oh, taste and see. He's a good God. Oh, somebody shout, he's a good God. Yes, he is. So that's my introduction. Let's preach. Here we go. Ezra knew how sweet God was. I'd give you this, but I'd be afraid you'd eat it. Let me drop it right here going to bother me if it's right here. I'll try to drink the apple instead of the water. I've done that before. I tried to drink the microphone one time. They ain't let me live that down. <laughs> Folks, we've established today God's been good to us as his people. And, and in the scriptures, the exile is over. In our text, the, the temple was getting ready to be rebuilt. And Ezra the priest was to be instrumental in the great work of restoration. Yet many had been lost in exile. Israel's worship to the one true God suffered. It is evidenced by the events surrounding our text. A contingent of leaders had come to Ezra with the disturbing news that certain of the priests, the Levites, and the people of Israel had married foreign wives. The worship of Jehovah was threatened by the introduction of strange gods into the homes of Israel. Ezra is stunned. He knew that Israel had slipped, but he had not realized they had gone so far. How could Israel, God's wife, if you will, turn from him and marry another lesser deity? How could they turn from Jehovah to false gods? 
And so to make matters worse, the last verse of the book of Ezra reveals that these unions had actually produced a mixed multitude. Not only did they serve false gods, but they had now married and now they were having children with the heathen. Nehemiah would then find that these children knew neither the language nor the God of their fathers. And so the Bible would tell us Ezra would weep all day. But at the time of the evening sacrifice, he cries out to God, asking him, God, forgive your people for their failures. He reminded God of his long suffering. He reminded God of his mercy. He reminded each and all who heard of that little space, there is grace. And I'm here today to remind us that God is a long suffering God. That Ezra was confident of this nature of God. That he was long suffering and each of us need a personal revelation of this God is not like you and me people are fickle God is not fickle he does not write people off you might but God don't You might say, well, they can't bring anything to society. But God says if they'll just commit themselves to me and put my life or put their life into my hands, if I can be generous and I can be patient, I can suffer long. The Bible says he is not willing that any should perish, but that all, all, all should come to repentance. That means it doesn't matter who you are today and what you've gone through and where you've been and the enemy has wrecked your life that day does not matter. God says if you'll come to me in your difficult time when the dark clouds are rolling in, I can still save you. Don't wait too late. Moses broke God's commandment, literally breaking all of them, and got a fresh revelation of the long suffering of God and the goodness of God. God could have said, you're a joker. I gave it to you one time. I ain't doing it again. And I think it's kind of funny. This time he had, to, he had to kind of chisel it out himself. The first time, the Lord took his finger and wrote it. The second time you read it, Moses had to do some work. You know, you'll think twice about breaking something you did. See, that's why sometimes the Lord will deliver you completely the first time. The second time he says, all right, you're going to have to do something this time. And I'll, I'll honor what you do. But I'm not doing it all for you again. God won't do for you what you can do for yourself. Now we still need the hand of God guiding us. We still need the hand of God upon us. But there will be times where the Lord will look at us and say, Okay, I'm long suffering, yes. But I'm not going to do it exactly how I did it the first time. Speak to the rock this time. Don't, don't hit... See, God doesn't always do things exactly the way that he's done it before. Moses trudges back up Sinai to see if God would be as kind to restore what he had in an uncalled manner cast down in anger. And on the second trip up Sinai, Moses heard God proclaim his name. The same name that the 80-year-old shepherd had heard at a burning bush in the wilderness. The name was repeated again with a new tag. I want you to look at this. It's found in Exodus chapter 34 and verse number 6. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. See, God's long-suffering is revealed in His merciful and gracious nature. God is gracious. We normally define grace as God's unmerited favor. Grace, like salvation, is a gift that comes undeserved. The amount given to a person who works a 40-hour week is called a wage. It's not called a gift. He earned what he got on Friday if he went to work Monday through Friday. If a person was to receive the same amount but rendered nothing in exchange that would be called grace man has nothing to exchange with God friend what he gives us is unmerited or unearned grace is one of the most important words in the Christian vocabulary it is used over 150 times in the New Testament alone we are saved by the grace of the almighty God and towering
something higher than the sins of man is the abounding grace of the Almighty. For Romans chapter 5, look at this. Verses 20 through 21, Paul would write, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. There is no error. There is no mistake. There is no chronic habit. There is no besetting sin that God's grace cannot overcome and overflow. Come on, somebody, when you think you have exhausted the grace of God, more grace comes rolling in. For our God is merciful. Paul said he is rich in mercy. Mercy is God's tender compassion. I'm here today to tell you grace is when God gives us what we don't deserve. But mercy is when God doesn't give me what I do deserve. I should have died. I should have been lost in my sin. But thank God for his mercy and thank God for his grace that says I will come and be the sacrifice for your sin. Grace says you don't deserve it. Mercy says I'll pay it. Jim Cimbala, pastor of the Brooklyn Tabernacle, big church, big choir, love their music. Jim Cimbala, pastor of the Brooklyn Tabernacle in his book, it's an old book now, Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire. Read that book, Brother Acey, probably six, seven times. I love that book. I'll read it over and over and over. He said this in that book. He said, I discovered an astonishing truth. I quote, God is attracted to weakness. He can't resist those who humbly and honestly admit how desperately they need him. Wow. God finds a person's needs irresistible do you know that God desires to grow close to you even while you're hurting you see it's a natural instinct of human beings and and, and even animals that when we start to hurt we want to seclude don't touch me don't get near me God's right the opposite he says you're hurting I want to be next to you I, I want you to understand that even though you're hurting, I've not left you. He, he draws near to the miserable and to the helpless. Why does he keep showing up in their dreams? Waking them up at night. He's drawing near to them. Man misinterprets God's long suffering to be that he either doesn't exist or that his word isn't true. But God's long suffering is evidence. He is a merciful and gracious God for a little space the Bible says there is grace but can I tell you today that God's grace is limited see I just knocked you about off your chair in some ways it isn't God's grace that can abound over your sin It can triumph over every wickedness or treachery. God's mercy is everlasting, endures forever. The loving kindness, compassion of God are without limits. God's grace is not limited by the size of the type of sin. God can forgive what we will let him forgive. Some people are good at holding on. Because, Brother Cannon, I don't get the attention if I'm still hurting. Now, don't act like you don't like somebody come up and say, are you okay? It feels good for somebody to care. And we must do that. Okay? We have to do that. But when our affliction becomes our lifestyle. See, I'm all about helping people. I'll buy groceries for somebody. As long as I know they're trying to help themselves. But the moment I learn that they won't get out and put a job application in. There's limits to what I'm going to do. God says, I'll help you. But I'm not going to let you abuse the grace of God. Paul would say, do we continue in sin and grace still abound? 
God forbid. There are limits. Even though your problem is not stronger than God, your self-will can push him out. Ooh, it just got uncomfortable. There are limits, Ezra said, for a little space. Grace. Grace has some constraints today. Look in God's word, you'll find them. God is limited by man's freedom to choose. It was never the will of God for Adam and Eve to get kicked out of the garden. Salvation is showed to us who will choose to believe and act upon the word of God and upon Christ's atoning work of Calvary. Saving grace calls for saving faith. The Bible says without faith, no man can please God. So the first thing is my freedom to choose. The second thing, God's grace is limited by my substituting self-righteousness for the righteousness of faith. Look at Galatians chapter 2, verse 16. Did I give you this, Brother Dylan? I think I did. Knowing, yeah, that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ. And look at this. And not by the works of the law. Last phrase, look at this. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. In other words, there's never a reason to treat people wrong. I don't care how holy we look. And I don't care how much we shout on Sunday. If our spirit ain't right, ain't nothing right. And he's saying, we cannot be justified in our flesh. Because my flesh says, i got to get even. But the word says, turn the other cheek. My flesh says, I'm going to hurt somebody that hurts me. But the word says, you must love your enemies and pray for them. What in the world is going on in our generation that even in the church, we feel like we can adopt some principles from the world. And says, man, I've even heard of people claiming they prayed. And I hope they didn't pray this prayer. Praying that God would return it back on people of what they had done to them. God help us. God is a merciful and gracious God. And let me even go as far as to say this, Brother Michael. God's people ought to be merciful and gracious. Because the Bible says, to him that has received much, much is He didn't say it was optional. He says it's required. Brother Heath, you got a new job. We're seeing you around a lot more. I like that part of it. I know that. But when you got into that job, they gave you requirements. For you to keep your job, you have to follow those. Why do we think that our relationship with God is any different? That we can tread upon the principles of the word of God and say, well, I'm okay. I got the goosebumps on Sunday. Pastor, I even prayed and spoke in tongues. That's good. But I hope the Lord don't come on Monday. I'm not I'm not pinning in on you now. I know you're just gonna squirt. What I'm saying is, we have got to focus on relationship. Because I highly doubt the Lord's going to come on church day. He might, but I highly doubt it. Because the Bible talks about how that there will be one in the field and one, see, one taken, one left. We know what the word says about the Sabbath. I'm not going there. A believer is freed from the curse of sin and the penalty of the law. We're not free to live as we please, though. See, I've heard people start claiming freedoms that the Lord never gave them. Yeah, you're free in the Spirit. You've got a freedom to choose. But those who continue in sin push away the grace of God. And Jesus said that those who love Him will keep His commands. God's grace is limited, number one, 
by my freedom to choose. Number two, by me trying to substitute my own self-righteousness for the righteousness of faith. Thirdly, God's grace is limited by my time on this earth. The time at the judgment seat of God is not the time for God's grace, and it ain't going to be there. To receive God's grace, man must have faith in Him. Those who believe according to the Scriptures will be saved. That's key. Believing according to the Scriptures. In the Bible, believing means obeying the Word. That does not contradict the message Jesus preached about being born again. Mark 16 says, Those who believe not will be damned. To believe and have faith in God for salvation, a person must be alive. I don't believe we can go pray over graves and save people. That's weird. That's stupidity. It's not biblical. That's not the time to be trying to save them. You should have been trying to reach them before they died. So grace is limited by my time here on the earth. I've given you a little space. I once read that when a sheep falls on its back, it can't get up by itself. It has to have help from beyond. We're a lot like sheep, the Bible says. We've gone astray. We've done things that we wish we hadn't have done. But you know what? The Bible also says when we fall, He's able to help us to get back up again. We need help from somewhere else. It's God's grace and mercy, these twin attributes of God, that will nudge us back to our feet. Grace gives us what we don't deserve. Mercy shields us from what we do deserve. And together, they can help pick us back up again. Perhaps this is why Solomon said that a living dog is better than a dead lion. For the living can still have hope that God's grace and mercy can reach him. God's mercy actively seeks the living today. And that tells me man ought to seek God while we can. The Bible says there's coming a day where no man can work. There's coming a time where no man can be saved. It's going to be too late. That's why I'm preaching in the final few moments of my sermon today. You ought not wait till tomorrow. Nobody's guaranteed tomorrow. We ought to act on what we know today and right now. If you've not been baptized in Jesus name we ought to do it today if you've not been filled with the Holy Ghost there's no better day than right here today to receive God's promise to you somebody say amen Amen. I got two pages left size 26 font it won't take long here we go you think I'm lying I'll show you it's 26 eyes are terrible Oh, Lord, now this computer's going to act nuts. Lord, help us. There we go. David said, God's goodness and mercy follows me. Notice, once I came in contact with God, it's following me all the days. Not just the good days. All the days of my life. At some point in your life, you must stop and realize there's something behind you. I've told the story before. Lord have mercy. I, I'm going to pay for all this, Brother Cannon, when these kids get bigger. My wife don't like dark places. And uh, if you've ever been here at night when she's going to the car, she don't waste time getting to the car. Because she's heard so many stories. We had a guy jump a fence one night, go rolling across the parking lot. This is back when Dad was still pastoring. Had to call the cops. and He had jumped out of a moving vehicle out here. We've, we've had all kinds of weird animals come up out here. We've had all kinds of, so she's got all this in her mind. And she's walking across the parking lot. One night, I just decided, I'm going to throw that door open out there, and I'm just going to take off running behind her. She beat me to the car. <laughs> she... she <laughs> She couldn't get the key in, but she beat me to the car. (laughs) Scared of what's behind her. Because she could hear it. She could see the shadow. But didn't know what it was. Can I tell you today that there is something that is on your heels. And it's not something to be scared of. And it's not something to run from. It's been the grace and mercy of God. That's trying to help you. That's trying to save you. That's trying to keep you safe. The grace and mercy of God. I love that that picture. He says, I got two bodyguards. Grace and mercy. Nothing can attack me from behind. If you study the armor of God, you'll notice everything is for the front. There's no armor protecting your back. Why? Because grace and mercy has got your back. 
you don't have to worry about what's coming up behind you as long as you know I've got God's grace and his mercy to cover me. Madeline Murray O'Hare had been lost for several years when they say mercy and grace found her. Yet I've seen others lost for a lot longer than that and without a clue as to their whereabouts when God's mercy and grace found them. Can I say today, you have not sinned too much that God cannot save you. The God who commands man to daily forgive 70 times 7 is rich in mercy. You have not reached the limit as far as the place where God can't save you yet. Where God's grace cannot reach you. There is a wideness. We used to sing this as a choir six, seven years ago. There's a wideness in God's mercy. But just like there is a thin line of atmosphere that protects life on the earth, grace is limited. Not in terms of distance, but in terms of time. As long as you have breath, there's still grace. Would you stand with me today? Would you respond to the one who is reaching for you today? I preached a message one time, God is looking for you. And I, I had the title slide of Uncle Sam standing there, big old bony finger. You've seen that sign. They used it back in, 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 in a time where they was trying to get people to join the military. And they put old Uncle Sam up there and he'd point his finger. I almost felt like that finger was jumping off the sign at you, didn't it? Me? Yeah. That's how it is with God's grace and mercy. It's trying to reach you. Everybody point at yourself. Say, that means me. God is trying to make sure he doesn't want anybody to be lost. For a little space. We used to sing it. They may sing it here in a minute. God's grace. God's grace. It's able to pardon and cleanse from sin. Oh, I'm thankful today. Brother, Brother Cook sings a song, You Can't Outrun the Long Arms of Love. It's because of His love He's got you here today. It's because of His grace and mercy that you can do something about where you are. You don't have to leave and worry about where you're going. Heaven or hell if you was to die. I'm not here to scare us today, but I do believe the Lord has given us some examples in the last 48 hours where people that we didn't know was sick, people we didn't know was going to die, have passed on. And, and you know what? I'm finding out, Brother Justin, it scares me to death. I, I've gotten to the point now, if I don't know I'm looking for a certain person in the obituary, I don't read it because there's young people in there now. And I start finding people younger than I am dying, and I'm like, oh, dear Lord. And I know the older I get, the more that's going to become prevalent. But I'm like, mercy. Young people are dying. You know, I was telling somebody the other day, you don't know who you're going to meet on the highway. They may be stoned out of their mind. You didn't do anything. Not that I'm scared of the person driving my car. It's much. I'm more scared of the person coming at me. None of us are guaranteed tomorrow. Well, I'm just going in for a little surgery. I've seen people die from just supposed routine surgery. Some of this stuff they call routine now. My wife come home and say, man, we had 50 of these kind of surgeries. I'm like, dear Lord. To me, any surgery could be a major surgery. You never know what happens. What I'm saying today is I'm not trying to scare Because if I have to scare you to the altar, Lord have mercy, I'm going to have to scare you every Sunday to get you to pray. That's not what I'm trying to do today. But I'm trying to get us in touch with reality that says I am not guaranteed. If I'm not right with God today, I don't need to leave this building until I know that if I was to not breathe another breath, that I would make heaven my home. If I can't lay down at night with peace and know that if I didn't wake up in the morning where I'm headed, then, Lord, I need you to do a work in my life today. And the Bible says you can come boldly before the throne of grace and mercy and find that help in a time of need. Would you pray with me right now? Lord Jesus, thank you for your presence. God, I thank you, Lord, for your goodness today and your mercy. 
Lord Jesus, I ask today, God, that you would help us to realize that the grace and mercy of God is not for just an elect for you. It's not for the elites among us, but it's for everybody. You said, God, you would pour out your spirit upon the handmaidens. That was, that was the lowest of lows. It doesn't matter how bad we feel today and how messed up our lives may seem and how many pieces our lives seems like it's a party in. But God... We know today that your master hands, your nail-scarred hands, can put all the pieces back together again, can mend broken hearts, can save souls that are lost today, can heal bodies. God, we know, Lord, that you're able to do these things. And many times we can limit you. The Bible says we can limit you with our unbelief. But there was one man that says, God, I've got faith, but help me with my unbelief. If there's people in this room today that they want to believe, but maybe they're they're challenged today and wondering if they can believe, Lord, give them the courage just to pray that prayer. Help us with our unbelief. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to invite everybody that will. Let's find ourselves a place to pray today. They're going to begin to sing. We want the grace of God to cover us. None of us are worthy to be where we are today. Would you ask God to help you? If you need to pray through again, pray through again. If you need to feel the arms of God again, wherever you are in your walk with God, would you come? Make a fresh commitment to God, a fresh time of consecration to Him. Come on. None of us are too great to to humble ourselves and say, God, I need you today, Jesus. Come on, let's talk to Him today in this building. In the name of Him.